Racing engines always run hot, and there's no doubt that the best cooled racers will be the ones running out in front when the checkered flag signals the end of the first 500 miles of California. There are two ways to cool the engines on these races. One is to run a rich fuel mixture. This uses large amounts of the methyl alcohol racing fuel mixture that would cause time-consuming stops for fuel. The second way is to add radiators, increasing the supply of cooling water to the engine. That penalizes the racer in terms of more frontal area to push around the racetrack. It translates to lost speed and horsepower, but only three pit stops. Andy Granatelli elects to take this risk. His crews mount the biggest radiators at the track. More than 400 square inches of radiator area mark in large nose cones on the STP team cars. Both entries, Mario's number one and George Bolmer's car number 20, have all the radiator capacity they can carry. And special coolants developed by STP technicians are also added to provide a final element of cooling safety for the STP team drivers. These various maneuvers to assure dependable cool running engines, despite the soaring temperatures, are tested and retested during the long and frustrating hours of practice. A behind the scenes side of racing rarely seen by spectators. Now the drama of qualifying. There are places in this rich race for only 33 cars. Only those who achieve the fastest speeds will qualify. First driver to make his try is veteran Lloyd Ruby of Wichita Falls, Texas. A favorite of the fans, Rube takes full advantage of his early shot at the fast new track. He hurtles around the course for a four lap 10 mile average of 177.567 miles an hour. His final lap barely sizzles with a speed of 178.042 miles an hour. The track is so new that crowds sit silent, not knowing what to expect from the spectacle they are witnessing. Forecasts were for scorching speeds, but nobody predicted this kind of performance from Lloyd Ruby. U.S. champion Mario Andretti accepts the speed penalty imposed by his huge new radiator and qualifies in eighth position with an average of 174.199 miles an hour. His teammate, George Fulmer, driving the STP Hawk, with which Mario won both the Indy 500 and the U.S. championship last year, takes his first shot at qualifying. After one lap at over 171 miles an hour, Fulmer loses control and goes off course in a long, looping spin. He comes back to qualify in 29th spot. There's one STP racing team car that arrives too late to qualify. A radical and brand new racing car just finished in Lingres, Germany. It must wait for another day to prove its mettle. It may be the car to watch when the 1971 season rolls around. The field, led by Lloyd Ruby, Dan Gurney, and Johnny Rutherford, lined up this way for the first 500 miles of California, and a first that will total more than three quarters of a million dollars. The crowds in California vary from those at the state fair tracks, just as the cars and the tracks are widely different. The bugaboo of soaring temperatures is on everyone's mind as the crewmen prepare their cars on race day. Here, the STP team makes wise use of dry ice to cool both the fuel supply tank 
as well as the saddle tanks on the team's racing cars. As the crewmen put final touches on their mechanical marbles, a new set of problems. Temperatures are down, but winds gust up to 40 miles an hour, and dust fills the air in the turn. Now Tony Holman, owner of famous Indianapolis Motor Speedway and one of racing's greatest figures, calls out, Gentlemen, start your engine. The crowd of over 175,000 spectators sit in awe as 33 racing athletes make final quick checks of brakes, steering, and other controls getting set for more than three hours of flat-out racing on the fastest two-and-a-half-mile oval of its kind. The Dodge pace car pounds around ahead of the field at 100 miles an hour. And as they move around this circuit, give them some indication that you are aware of the undertaking Watching the ship alone to see if we'll get a start now. This is the moment of truth for the 33 drivers as the 500 miles of California starts rolling into the history of 20th century sports. Brave Jim Hurtabies, who started dead last after renewed tries to get his front engine roadster up to speed, slams into the wall to become the first dropout in a procession of mishaps that will decimate the field before the day of racing ends. He's unhurt, but goes in for a checkup just the same. Freddy's car number one is running smoothly. He's driving at a set pace by direction from the STP pits. His object, make only three pit stops, while the leaders must make four stops for fuel. Lloyd Ruby, the super-fast pole position starter, is already having problems. Bobby Unser, former Indy 500 winner and U.S. champion, is through for the day. Johnny Rutherford, another front row qualifier, goes out with a burn piston. Granatelli prepares to bring Mario Andretti into the pits for his first fuel stop. Mario is running back in the pack, right on target, awaiting a chance to make his move for victory. Stop is smooth and precise. Tanks are topped off, tires are checked, and Mario roars back into battle. His eye on a lion's share of the first and championship points that come with victory. George Fulmer, who has steadily improved his position, glides in for his load of fuel and moves smoothly out again. Al Unser, the race leader and odds on favor to win it all, also gets rapid fire from service.
Racing luck strikes at George Fulmer, the second man on the STP team. A cracked oil tank, not repairable, takes him out of the race after 76 laps of heads-up driving. He'll be scored as the 20th place finisher. His prize for a short day's work will amount to $8,000. Now Dan Gurney smacks the wall, but he's not hurt, and he's credited with 18th finishing spot, although he started in second place. At 100 laps, the race is half finished. Mario Andretti, coached from the STP scoring stand by Andy Granatelli, begins to steadily pick up his pace. The engine still runs sweetly. Mario, who started in eighth spot, works his way to fifth position, then fourth, and finally into third place. Still leading is Al Unser, who won Indianapolis this year in a near-perfect drive and has done everything exactly right all season long. But his pace in this race is frightfully fast. The STP crewmen are betting that his 170 mile an hour clip will cause his car to break, or else cost him so dearly in fuel consumption that an extra pit stop will rob him of his two lap lead. Meanwhile, Mario Andretti gets signals from his pit crew and bides his time as he rolls into the second half of the 500 miles of California. A.J. Foyt comes in for a long, long pit stop. Joe Leonard, Indy track record holder, catches fire. Mario Andretti rolls in for his third and final planned pit stop. The SDP team has carefully calculated fuel use. Now, Mario can blast through the rest of the race without another stop for fuel. The calculations are working. Mario goes out to bid for second place and a try for the brass ring on this world's biggest merry-go-round of sports. The STP team has figured that the sizzling lap speeds of the cars leading this race have cost them dearly in fuel consumption. And the scorching speeds may cost even more in engine wear. The race spins on, and hope grows stronger with the crewmen of Mario Andretti. The fuel consumption guess is correct. Here's Al Unser in for an extra pit stop. Roy Yarbrough comes in for fuel. And Pete Repson comes in. And trouble keeps him pitted. Mario has now moved into the second spot. The plan is working. Mario Andretti has worked his way into striking position for first place, now only nine seconds behind Al Unser, who leads the race. But Lady Luck turns fickle. Something's gone wrong with Mario Andretti's flame red car number one. And at almost the precise same moment, misfortune strikes at the blue and yellow car of Al Unser. The beautiful game plan of the STP team is shattered. A rear end pinion gear, an almost unheard of trouble source, has failed. And Mario is out. The fans applaud Leroy Yarborough. The show is over for Mario Andretti. A 10th place finish after 182 laps of driving that was a strategic masterpiece. Despite a pit stop that went on for long, weary minutes, A.J. Foyt finally roars back into the heat of battle. Pete Revson in the yellow McLaren car has lost his chance for victory with a nine-minute pit stop.
suffered when he swooped into the pits with front runners Al Unser and Leroy Yarborough. Revson is back in the race with no chance of winning. And Jim McElreath in car number 14 works his way up into the lead. That's A.J. Foyt into the wall. He's not hurt, and he scrambles to help remove his wreckage so McElreath, his teammate, can have a shot at passing Art Pollard for first place. If the Foyt wreckage stays on the track and the yellow caution flag stays out, the race will end in a parade, and McElreath will have lost his precious chance. The sheer drama of the final five laps literally set the crowd on fire. Art Pollard, oldest driver on the course, finds himself in the lead after a steady drive in car 64. The scorers first showed he was a full lap ahead of McElreath in car 14. Then the scoring lights blinked to change. McElreath passed him. Pollard retook the lead on lap 198. Then McElreath passed Pollard a final time two laps from the end. The durable Texan out in front by only two precious seconds for the white flag and held excellently for the checkered flag of victory on the final lap. It was a bitter pill for Pollard to swallow. For McElreath at 42, this victory brought undying fame as the winner of the first ever race at this great new speedway, plus $146,850 in prize money for a first place win. He goes into the history books along with Ray Haroon, who won the first big Indianapolis 500 back in 1911. Haroon's Mormon Wasp took just under seven hours to run 500 miles. McElwraith won this one in three hours and seven minutes at an average of 160.107 miles an hour. Here's the way the rest of the field finished in this historic race. <laughs> 